to try and go to windward here because it's sloppy and horrible. We don't want to spend too much time mucking around with the sails getting wet and spraying our face and things like that. Well, it's more sailing to weather this week as we tack our way into Shark Bay to arrive in the protected waters of Monkey Mire, where we forage for our dinner in the shallows. Oh, yeah, big one. Welcome to Free Range Sailing. For those of you that are new here, I'm Pascal and this is Troy. For the last four years and 180 episodes, we've circumnavigated Australia, culminating with a very demanding year refitting our 1969 Australian built Clansman 30 sloop rigged yacht and sailing her across the Great Australian Bight. Now we've returned to our home state, we're taking the time to explore some of the places we didn't get the chance to see as much of before. Join us each week for more great sailing, fishing and adventure as we cruise the West Australian coast. After a few days in Teg's channel and with all our chores completed, we were happy to leave Carnarvon in search of a more protected anchorage, even if it meant sailing into the weather once more. This is like the, this is a perfect time for our wind vane. Normally we have like a little electronic tiller pilot on it controlling it. And we do that when we want to hold a very straight line and we'll adjust the sails around it. But at the moment what we want to do is just trim the sails for the best possible attack to try and go to windward here because it's sloppy and horrible. We don't want to spend too much time mucking around with the sails getting wet and spraying our face and things like that. And so we've put the actual wind vane on and the reason being is we're expecting the wind to slightly shift around to the east and we want to optimise the boat but we want the boat to come around a little bit more to the southeast as we go further down into the into Shark Bay here. So by putting it by putting it on the wind vane now, we don't have to do the steering. As the wind swings the boat will come around and that's what we want. We did that when we we're coming out of Tassie as well. So depending on what we want to do, we either use the machine brain if we want to hold a straight line, or sometimes it suits our purposes to actually follow the wind and then we don't have to touch the sails. Because putting a foil on the wind vane, everything's balanced nicely, so it steers relative to the wind. And as the wind changes, the boat changes, but all the sail set remains the same and the efficiency and everything else like that. Because we're, uh, we're going into a pretty short, sharp chop at the moment, so we're only getting like four and a half to five knots, whereas normally we've been getting around at six and a half knots, so it's, it's cutting our speed, but going to weather's never nice, um, but we're just forced to do it. The wind never really gets out of the south here at this time, and we have to go south. <laughs> but um, we'll just, we'll suck it up for today, and then that'll have us in a nice position to sort of enjoy ourselves in more sheltered waters down near Monkey Mire. So that's what it sounds like up in our V-berth when we're smashing to weather, you know, like when we're um, climbing up over waves and actually going through a couple of them. We don't have a we don't have much of a cord deck. There's like part of it is um, marine ply, one inch thick, sandwiched in, but forward of that it's just solid glass, and the hull also is not sandwiched at all. It's it's um, it's solid glass. So it can be a little bit noisy up here, um, and a little bit cool actually. Like at the moment, you know, we're getting evaporative cooling, so it feels a little bit colder up here, but it's definitely a lot more noisy up here than it is back there. Oh, 
maybe one interesting thing is back here in the anchor locker you can hear that the the chain in there is not like smashing around very much um, because Marul's bow is very very much of a sharp V the, the the chain sits in there really well and it doesn't like we have to be in a very very heavy seaway before it starts getting thrown around and potentially being tangled in knots It was a little bit of a chain knock, but it's just it's just swinging. Doesn't sound too bad, does it? So we're throwing our tack in, um, we're getting along pretty nicely, we're tracking towards our destination, we'll have to do, fingers crossed, one more tack to get into the anchorage, um, but yeah, so far so good, um, obviously we've been close hauled the whole way, but we've had about 4.8 knot average I think, so we're doing alright, considering that we've been going into weather, and the seas have definitely calmed off, the wind has eased. Everything's just a little bit more chilled now. We're in the sort of blue water and we're going over, shortly we'll be going over some shoal ground. So we put the, the rod out, we put the lure out, hoping for a fish. And so it concludes quite a tough bit of sailing. A, we've, we've spent a long time going to weather now. <laughs> We're sort of anchored off a little resort here, a place called Monkey Mire. Um, it's not our usual deal, but it's really, really sheltered. There's a possibility of a beer, um, but right now I'm just going to relax because we've had like a week of sort of smashing to weather. And I'm, oh yeah, I shouldn't say that. We had a fair bit of time getting into Carnarvon, and it was a bit rolly. We did lots, and then we've like really had to like work to get down here so we're gonna have a few days off so Pasky will probably be grumpy at me because I'm talking to one of our action cams so the audio sorry if it's bad but I'm kind of knackered and uh, getting the big camera out just beyond me at the moment I'm gonna go and have a nice hot cup of tea <laughs> thanks for coming with us At Monkey Mire, feeding the bottlenose dolphins dates back to the 1960s when fishermen started offering some of their catch to them each day. The dolphins still catch the bulk of their food themselves in the wild, but come in for a visit and a small feed in the morning. This unique interaction has allowed dolphin researchers from all over the world to come to Monkey Mire and develop a better understanding of their behaviour, ecology, genetics, communication and social structure.
a big one. Yeah, so it really helps to keep looking if you find one. You often find like two or three more like just in the same little spot. So this is the second one I found in the same spot. We're just working along the edge of this weed bank. We found that we've been finding them like one after the other. Oh, that's a dead one. <laughs> of course, when the camera's rolling, I find a dead one. Curse of the camera. Yeah. So we've purged those pippies in that landing net that we showed you yesterday um, overnight and we're going to steam them now before we add them to a delicious um, Thai green pawpaw salad, a som tam. We actually bought a green pawpaw in Carnarvon at the local Asian grocers. So um, yeah, we're going to pop them in and see, open them and just give them a try and see what they taste like and make sure that there's no grit inside them. We'll see, we'll see how they turn out. So I've got um, a pot of boiling water here with a steamer basket in it. I'm just going to chuck them on top, put the lid on and then open it after about a minute and see if they've popped open. So you saw us collecting them yesterday and I found that the um, easiest way to find them was to follow along the edge of the weed bed. The sand isn't as deep because there's a bit of roots from the seaweed but also we think that the they might like being on the edge, like that differentiation in between like weed bed and sand. It might be better better ground for them for food. Um, so yeah, we, we found them that way. They're really beautiful, like there's a few different varieties here. I really like this one, it's very pretty shell and then there's this one with like a real like uh, corrugated shell and there's this variety that's quite flat it's got a corrugation as well and it's got a little bit of a zigzag pattern three obvious different types but maybe there's subtypes within that I don't know I'm gonna pop the lid and have a look it's been a couple of minutes mmm they smell really good uh, some of them are starting to open but they haven't all opened yet stirring them to um, pop them open. <laughs> just to have an even heat all around. This one's popped open so we can try this one out and just see what's going on. There we go. Quite a lot of meat in there, look at that. It's quite a meal. Mmm. Oh, there's a tiny bit of grit in there. It's not offensive though. They're, they're quite rich. They've got a really strong seafoody flavour. It's good. I like it. They're enormously popular with the Aboriginals, eh? Really, they're really nice. They've popped, baby. <laughs> Round two. That one's got a fair bit of row. I'm pushing it. So that one there is, yeah. but that's in built grit, that's stuff they're making themselves, yeah. almost like a little pearl, isn't it? Yep. But anyway, these have not had a single bit of mud or sand or anything in them, which is unusual. Nice and purged, that out uh, overnight in the, in the net. Definitely worked. So this is a green pawpaw, which I've cut in half, and now I'm just putting the seeds everywhere. Um, I'm just peeling it, getting the seeds out, and then we're going to use this fancy tool, which is Troy's got from his Thai neighbour, um, which is for 
making nice julienne, like long strips of the pawpaw. So I'll show you how we do it, but you basically just peel the pawpaw. It kind of tastes like a vegetable when it's like this. There's not any sweetness yet because the fruit's not ripe. So it's a really yummy, refreshing salad. Um, it's seasoned with um, sugar, lime juice, lots of chili, lots of garlic and herbs and fish sauce. So it'll be really tasty. I think it'll be nice to have um, the little morsels of cockles with a delicious salad. Well, we got the pawpaw done, it took about half an hour. Yeah, it'd be much nicer with a mandolin slicer, but we've only got that little tool and it takes up a much le less space on the boat and we wouldn't use it very often, so it's better to just have a small tool and take a bit of time and just enjoy the moment, be part of the, the present. So, sometimes quite spicy, quite salty, quite sweet, lots of garlic, so I'm just, normally, again, you'd use a mortar and pestle to bash up the garlic and the chilli, but we don't have one because it takes too much space on the boat again, and it's heavy, so we're just using our little tiny food processor um, to do this step. So here we've got two big cloves of garlic and two big chilies as well. Um, you can add more or less to taste. We'll see how this goes. I'm, I'm hesitant. I think I should put more garlic in, but I think that's probably enough. Raw garlic's pretty strong. We don't eat that much raw garlic. Huh. Normally you put like dried shrimp or shrimp paste in, we don't have that, so, and we've only got a really intense shrimp paste that I don't want to use for this dish, so I'm going to put some of the cockles in now to kind of give it, this is the dressing that I'm making to give it a kind of seafood flavour and then we'll put some in at the end, like just mix through the salad at the end as well. The sourness in this dish comes from the juice of two limes, which I'm adding here. And next we added fish sauce, which is the salty element of the dish. Thank you. So much. About half a cup, or a quarter of a cup I'm doing. Then I've got coconut sugar. Normally you'd use palm sugar, but I don't have any. Put a tablespoon of sugar in there. Palm sugar. No, not palm sugar, coconut sugar, because we don't have palm sugar. Um, and yeah, just mashing it in. Mashing everything together. This is my make, do mortar and pestle combination here. I guess we'll just try everything and just see what it's like. Yum. Ooh, it's salty, <laughs> chili and garlic, but that's good. By the time it's mixed through that salad, it won't be too salty. Don't put Pascal's cold and cool remedy. Yeah, totally. Next, I chopped up some raw French beans to add to the salad. I also added a ripe raw tomato to add some more sourness to the dish. Tomato is traditionally used in this dish, and I like the splashes of red in the salad. We've got this stuff which is like, um, it's similar in flavour to coriander, but it tastes a little bit more like Thai basil, I reckon, than coriander. But uh, sorry, it has a bit more of a Thai basil flavour, but it still tastes like coriander. Um, actually, for this dish, you should be using Thai basil, but I don't have it. I have this, so we're going to use this instead. I think the only thing in this pawpaw salad that's legit is pawpaw, isn't it? Chilli, garlic. No. Oh, yeah. Sauce. The flavours are going to be the same pretty much. I mean, Thai basil is a bit different. But... You're an innovator. Mm, we have to be. With the Mexican coriander or cilantro chopped up and added, I decided to add a couple of teaspoons of peanut butter to the dressing. A quick muddle in the jug to combine all the ingredients, and then I found a larger container to mix our salad in. Let's put our seafood in. Mm -mm. And we're going to put in our dressing. To squish it all together. Oh, try not to make a mess. Does it smell good to you, Troy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you've done such a good job there. Thank you. It's all about using your hands, isn't it? Here you guys. Mm -hmm. A little bit of cockle. Tomato. Pawpaw. Mm. 
Authentic? Delicious. That's so good. Mm. What, what do you think of the little um, piggies? Piggies are really good in it. Really good in it. Thanks everyone for watching this week. If you enjoy the video, thanks also for hitting the like button as it really helps to get our video recommended to other like-minded people. Our boat is currently up for sale down in Perth. If you're interested, please check the ad which I've included in the description of the video. Until next time, see ya.